All right, so in this lecture, we're going to talk about male nutrition. And the two main types of male nutrition we'll focus on are quashi orco and marasmus. These are diseases of inadequate food intake and poor diet, and they're more commonly seen in third world countries, very rare to see these in a developed country. And unfortunately, they're often more commonly seen in children. Now, there's two main differences you want to pay attention to how you can distinguish these. So quashi orco typically occurs after age 18 months. And the way you would define this is, you, is its protein deficiency with adequate energy intake. They're getting the, base, the baseline energy intake they need from carbohydrates, fats, other sources. The big thing is they're deficient in their protein intake and their amino acid intake. And one main reason for that is that before age 18 months, they're getting most of their protein intake from breast milk. And then as the child weans off of breastfeeding, then they're deficient in their, in their diet of proteins and amino acids. And so that's when they can develop kwashiorkor. Versus marasmus, this is inadequate energy intake in all forms. So decreased carbohydrates, decreased fat, decreased protein intake. And because of that, this usually occurs before age one year. And that's so important because during that first year, growth and development are so heavily dependent on adequate nutritional intake. So quashi orcor, again, like we said, this is caused by protein deficiency. What that really leads to is decreased oncotic pressure in the blood vessels. So if we review what oncotic pressure is, so if we look at, this is in normal individual here, so you have proteins floating around in the blood. The main one would be albumin that contributes to oncotic pressure. So this, let's say these are albumin. And remember, you have what's called hydrostatic pressure, which we'll say is pH here, which helps push water or fluid out of the, out of the blood vessels, out of the capillaries into surrounding tissue. Now, you can't push all of the fluid out of the blood because that, you know, then that would create serious problems. So you need a force to offset that. And what you have is an osmotic force that offsets that called the oncotic pressure, which is the osmotic pressure of protein within the blood. Because remember, osmosis causes water to shift towards areas of higher protein density. And so again, that helps offset this hydrostatic pressure. The problem in quashi orcor is you have significant protein deficiency, which often manifests as decreased serum albumin. And so as you can see here, we have significant decrease in serum albumin. And so you still have that hydrostatic pressure pushing fluid out. The problem is that oncotic pressure is much smaller now because there's much less protein floating in the blood. And so as a result of that, you have significant fluid extravasation from the blood vessel into surrounding tissue. This leads to edema, which is a hallmark presentation of this, of this disorder. And then you have fluid buildup as well. Protein deficiency, it also leads to decreased production of apolipoproteins. And remember from what we talked about in Unit 3, apolipoproteins transport fat away from the liver, the site of fat metabolism. So as a result, you have this buildup of fat in the liver, and so you have a fatty liver. The other thing that happens in these individuals is they have decreased production of immunoglobulins. And so as a result of that, they're susceptible to infections. And then the way you can diagnose or observe this disease is by measuring serum albumin. They're going to have significantly decreased levels of serum albumin. Clinical features, edema and ascites. Again, this is, is due to the decreased production of protein, decreased protein serum levels of protein. Diarrhea, this is thought to be due to a loss of brush border intestinal enzymes. Swollen abdomen, again, due to that significant edema and ascites. Fatty liver changes due to those decreased levels of apolipoproteins. You will see less wasting in these individuals than you would in individuals with marasmus, and then decreased immunity, again, due to decreased immunoglobulin production. Now, marasmus, this is caused, again, by total calorie malnutrition of protein, fat, and carbohydrates. So just total malnutrition, total inadequate energy intake. And the clinical features of this are going to be growth retardation, loss of body weight, loss of muscle mass, and then loss of fat tissue. Because remember, during prolonged starvation, 
you're going to switch from using carbohydrates to using fats and amino acids. And so as a result of that, you're going to have breakdown of fatty acids, loss of adipose tissue, and then eventually going to lead to breakdown of proteins. So you're going to lose muscle mass and other organ, critical organ tissue as well to produce amino acids. And then in, these, in this disorder, edema may or may not be present. Now we're going to go to the whiteboard here for a second because with both of these disorders, when you're treating them, you, what you want to do is prevent something called refeeding syndrome. Now, during starvation, like we said, we're switching from carbohydrates to fat and amino acids. What happens is also during starvation is you have decreased insulin secretion because you're not eating, and then also you're at the same time having increased glucagon because you're trying to maintain at least the bare minimum levels of carbohydrate levels and other metabolites as well. So you have increased glucagon as a result of that. The other important thing to note during starvation is you have decreased cell stores of minerals such as phosphorus, magnesium, potassium, and that's to maintain normal serum levels. Because if you have dramatic fluctuations in these, such as potassium, that can cause abnormal heart rhythms and that can kill somebody. And so during, even during starvation, the body's depleting these cellular stores to help preserve these serum levels to help pres you know, preserve heart function. Now, if you refeed someone too fast, what will happen is you'll have obviously an a increase of insulin that'll be resp in response to the new elevation in blood glucose levels. And remember what insulin does, in addition to promoting uptake of glucose, is it promotes the synthesis of glycogen, fat, and protein. Now the problem with that is that the synthesis of these things, it uses up a lot of phosphate because you're making things such as, you know, glucose 6-phosphate. You, you use up magnesium, you use potassium. And so what happens is, you're, is you further deplete the cellular stores of these, which then decreases serum levels. And when you decrease serum levels, like we said, you, because what's going to happen is you're going to have movement of these electrolytes into the cell to try to replenish these depleted minerals that were used for synthesis of these, of these metabolites. And so what happens is you have decreased serum levels, and then like we said, that puts you at risk for abnormal heart rhythms. And so again, if you, and so the bottom line is if you re refeed too fast, you put patients at risk for abnormal heart rhythms. You can also see this in patients that have had energy depletion due to severe illnesses. So you definitely, in certain patients in the ICU, you want to be careful of refeeding syndrome as well, surgical, some surgical patients as well, trauma patients. Um, so this is not just relevant for patients that have undergone severe starvation. Now, the way you treat this is you refeed slowly but frequently. So this would be meals, you know, every small meals every two to four hours per se. And so that, again, you know, the idea is you want to gradually ease the body back into a normal nourished state. All right, so that closes out our discussion of malnutrition and refeeding syndrome.